on Vikasit Bharat at 2047, Opportunities and Challenges. It is indeed our honor and privilege to have Mr. Tuhin Sinha with us. But while we get going and before we start the session, we have a small video on uh, Lord Birsa Munda, which uh, Sir has kindly shared it with us. And we would want to kickstart this session with a small video. And then we start with the session. किसी राज्य का भविष्य तभी उज्ज्वल होता है जब वो अपने अतीत के अनुभव और विरासत के गर्व से पल पल जुड़ा है who belong to Jharkhand, I'm sure you're aware of uh, Bhagwan and Lord Birsa Munda. He's a great tribal warrior and hero. And uh, literally, he's worshipped as the Lord and Almighty. There are statues everywhere in Ranchi and across various cities in Jharkhand. So uh, a great cheer for this book on the tribal warriors. And there are a series of books which we have procured and we have kept it in the library uh, for all of us to read. Uh, <coughs> I have the honor of and privilege of introducing Mr. Tuhin Sinha, but prior to that, uh, Tuhin, I would want you to come and occupy the dais, <laughs> along with Dr. Manasar Nagabhushnam. I would request our director, Dr. Manasar Nagabhushnam, to kindly come up on the dais and occupy her seat. I'll just, just say a few words. Yeah. I would also request Dr. Manasar to introduce about our institute to our guest. And, I, and then I will read out Sir's profile. Good morning. So it's a fresh day today and a great day with uh, Tuhin Sinha being with us, the leader of the future. So on behalf of Ramaya Group of Institutions, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Tuhin Sinha for accepting your, your invitation and <laughs> consenting to speak to our students. Dear students, I feel that you are all very lucky today. Because who is the future? We belong to the Esther years already. So the future of the country is you. Right? In each one, there is a leader. You are the one who can show the direction to the nation, to people around you, and you can build on the circle of influence. So, we are privileged that a leader who has expanded 
his ego boundaries and has become a leader with a greater circle of influence he is here today to set the pace and give you, give us a direction as to what should be our thought process how we think and how we can contribute at our level to this great nation so we know that our nation in the last few years has taken greater strides has progressed and today if we see our gdp which is 7.6% which has been announced so it's a, it's something really great what we have achieved and i am sure that with our participation in the future we are going to contribute very greatly to this growing country and there is no doubt that we are going to become the vishwa guru and all other countries will look at us and follow us at ev on everything whatever we have been doing be it education be it politics be it health be it environment so in uh, we already saw what was the contribution in the sector of health during the covid times so unprecedented unexpected right so that is what was the contribution and it is going to expand to all the sectors of this nation tohin sinha is a thought leader he is a writer so a person who can express something in his writings is a person who gets deep into every aspect looks it from all sides and only then the writing part comes out so uh, we are really fortunate to him for uh, having joined us <laughs> thank you and uh, to introduce about ramaya group of institutions uh, we are a 60 plus year old institution we started in the year 1962 this group and uh, it went on to expand to almost all the areas of education now we have a multidisciplinary campus here with law with engineering with medical with uh, nursing with all medical sciences and uh, the management and almost all the areas have been explored and we create a kind of a uh, uh, synergistic relationship between all the institutions here and it's a multi truly multidisciplinary environment so what we have been talking that we need inputs from all sides rigveda says that you ano badra krutavo yantu vishvatah so that is you have to take knowledge from all sides and it is truly happening at ramaya group okay so uh, this institution ramaya institute of management was established in 1995 and uh, we have a flagship program which is the pgdm program uh, we have a th 300 student intake and now we have stepped forward to embrace entrepreneurship through a program called as pgdm innovation entrepreneurship and venture development so we are building this uh, the incubation facilities at our institution so that we can see that the future entrepreneurs of this nation will come out from our institutions so apart from this we also have a program on sports management we also cater to the executives through a, a number of executive programs also so we have uh, programs on business analytics digital marketing financial analytics as well as a professional program for all the executives which is a miniature mba program so this is uh, uh, our introduction and we have been faring well in all the rankings and ratings and we are one among the top uh, 100 business schools and top 10 business schools in bangalore so this is about us and uh, we look forward to hear you thank you thank you manasam ma'am for uh, brief introduction about the ramya group and also about our institute i would uh, like to i would request you to kindly felicitate our guest mr tuhin with a sapling
Thank you, ma'am. Now, to begin with our session on Vikasit Bharat at 2047 Opportunities and Challenges, we have the future leader of our country, Mr. Tuhin Sinha. I have the honor and privilege to read out his profile. Tuhin A. Sinha is a best selling author, columnist, and politician. He is presently the national spokesperson of the Bharatiya Janata Party. Tuhin is acknowledged amongst the most prolific Indian writers with a maverick knack to experiment with new genres. Tuhin recently completed an acclaimed trilogy on India's unsung subaltern freedom fighters with his books, The Legend of Birsa Munda, The Great Tribal Warriors of Bharat, and Siddho Kanu. So we have procured these books and we'll keep them in our library. Uh, Tuhin's books traverse a wide range of subjects across both the fiction and non-fiction genres. As a popular media voice of the BJP, Tuhin has been vocal and articulate on all recent political issues through his articles in print and appearances on news debates. Uh, Boys and Girls, Viksit Bharat, which has developed India. Uh, Ma'am and Tuhin, if you want to say it in two words, I want to say it in Hindi. Uh, Vikshit Bharat, Pradhan Mantri Narendra Modi ji ne saaf spashti karan shabdo mein kaha tha um, in August 2023 when he unfurled the flag, he said at 2047 we will unfurl the flag and hoist the flag of a Vikshit Bharat which is a developed India where there will be complete infrastructural facilities and uh, some poor women empowerment complete Mahila Sashakti Karan. Am I right, sir? That these were the complete words of uh, our Prime Minister during the uh, flag hoisting uh, in August 2023 when he hoisted our flag from the ramparts of Lal Kila. And uh, on these words, I'm sure Tuhin has a lot of his insights and uh, ideas to share and discuss about Viksit Bharat over to you. And I'm sure you as future leaders of the country will have lots of good takeaways from this session. Thank you so much and over to you to him. Good morning everybody. Respected Mansa ma'am, respected Padmaja ji, respected Niranjan ji. Sorry sir, I forget your name. Purnajit. Respected Purnajit sir and uh, all the wonderful students present here. I'm fortunate to be in the middle of all of you because Ramaya Institute somehow gives a very positive feel when you enter over here. And uh, from the uh, oratory abilities of Mansa Ma'am and Padmaja Ji, I can tell you that you all are also extremely fortunate to be at Ramaya Institute. Viksit Bharat is a very interesting subject, you know, um, 23, 24 years ago when we were students of management, the most heartening thing for me is that uh, we never thought we would be discussing this. Um, one and a half months ago, I was at IIFT, Kolkata, talking about India's digital uh, policy and India's digital diplomacy for the world. So. At the outset, I feel it is very heartening that management students today are far more aware of governance, of uh, what's happening in the country. Because in our days, the focus essentially, the, the, the primary focus was to get, you know, good placement and then think about the country. So I think that's a huge difference which, uh, which has come about. I think the, the consciousness, the, res the sense of responsibility towards the future of the country is enormous in the student community, and I think I must congratulate you, all of you, for that. Uh, are you like first year management students, most of you, or second year, or both? Okay, okay. So, and I'm sure you must be, you must have come from across the country. So, when we talk about Viksit Bharat, see, in the last nine and a half years, if you look at the basic approach of the government, it has been twofold. One is empowerment of those who needed to be empowered, the deprived sections of society. And number two, you know, to give that aspirational boost to those empowered. 
So while through our digital public infrastructure, at the core of which is the Jam Trinity, you must have heard of Jam Trinity, the Jandhan Aadhaar, Aadhaar mobile linkage, which makes the digital public infrastructure possible and which now is being emulated by many countries across the world. So on the one hand, while our digital public infrastructure has make, made sure that you know the deprived section of society get the benefits which they were deprived of. For example, today you would be you would be surprised or you would be probably aware of the fact that some 30 lakh crore worth of money has been transferred directly into the hands of beneficiaries across the world through this jam trinity, which is Jandhan Adhar Mobile. So today, you know, uh, uh, a widow living in a far-flung village somewhere 150 kilometers from Karnataka, from Bangalore, what would happen eight or nine years ago would be that she would need to travel for a good five, six hours to reach the nearest bank to pick her, to pick her, you know, uh, widow allowance. If her now, thanks to the digital prowess, thanks to the the common service centers which have been set up in each of the village. This happens within a matter of a few minutes. So thanks to you know the Aadhaar uh, biometric evaluation, immediately the common service center in the village corroborates whether the person who is the recipient is authentic or no. So, and within minutes, um, you know, the amount is given to her in cash in lieu of which, um, her deposit or her, you know, the amount which is supposed to come into her account goes to the common service center. So a lot of things have happened which has made the life of the common person better. And most of these things have been happening in villages. For example, 13 crore new tap connections in villages, what does it mean eventually? That women who would be spending or the girl child who would be spending a good two or three hours going to the nearest pond or the nearest river to fetch water can devote that time to studies. The Swachh Bharat Abhyan, when, you know, from a 39 meagre, 39 percent sanitation cover, if the sanitation cover has gone up to 100 percent in the last nine and a half years, again, the biggest beneficiary has been the rural woman because she, it saves her time. You know, she doesn't have to wake up at four in the morning to go to, you know, to the fields. And all of this time is is productively utilized. So, uh, in a way, it is creating human capital. In the last 20 years, I was reading a data, 80 crore Indians, that's a whopping number, 80 crore Indians in the last 20 years, which is, you know, 2.5 times the population of US, have got access to electricity. So imagine the kind of human capital we are creating because obviously the moment you have electricity, the ambitions increase, the, the aspirations increase, and the abilities increase. The same is happening with the mobile today. The mobile is not a mere tool of communication. With 120 crore mobile handsets in the country and about 50% of which have internet connections, most of the, you know, I think, uh, the rural market has expanded in a way, even for multinationals, you know, it, it has expanded in a way that nobody would have imagined. And for the first time, India's huge population, instead of being seen as a liability, is being viewed as an asset across the world. You know, so all those people who are, who are talking of population control bills, if you ask me the right time to bring the population control bill was in the 1970s and 1980s, today the rate of growth of our population is anyway declining and post 2047, if you look at certain data, the population is actually going to start declining. But at present, this humongous Indian population with the strength of democracy offers the best opportunities for investors across the world. The reason why we record a mammoth 7.6% GDP growth in the last quarter, which exceeds our own expectations. So some, I was at a, at a um, you know, conclave last weekend, and somebody just cracked a, an unsuspecting joke. It might seem a little, you know, 
a lot of you with urban sensibilities may not relate with that joke, but it's about a saint who was traveling in a crowded train and he wanted to get down at the next station. He couldn't get down at the next station because there was a huge crowd of people wait, waiting to get into the train. So every time he would reach the exit gate, he, he would be pushed back into the seat and this happened three or four times till he and eventually he had to get down at the last station which was a good half an hour away. So this seat is the story of India today. Even if, even if India wants to slow down, it cannot slow down. That is the kind of human capital that has been created in the last couple of decades, more so in the last decade. That is the kind of opportunities that have been created. And that is the, the, the quantum and the strength of market that the world is looking at when it comes to India. And that is the reason why you know, all the economic indicators suggest that uh, India's growth trajectory will continue to remain the same and if at all will only increase in the years to come. A lot of it has obviously been possible because of the impetus on infrastructure, because you know infrastructure provides seamless connectivity across the country. In the same way that the, the, the DPI, the digital public infrastructure, made sure, ensured that money was put directly into the hands of the deprived classes. Infrastructure creation has ensured that there is barely any disparity between Bangalore and, you know, let's suppose a small village in Chhattisgarh. Today in the Northeast, even after, you know, when you land up in Gohati, it will take you barely about three hours to reach most corners of Northeast. Ten years ago, it would take you probably one and a half days to travel from Gohati to the other parts of the country. So the disparity between the haves and have-nots have increasingly decreased. Today, and, and the beauty of India's growth story is that we are weaving in the best of capitalism with socialism. So 81.35 crore people continue to be continue to be fed or continue to be given free ration which which has shielded them during the covid pandemic now you know like uh, as students of economics many of you may have a different opinion on it but you know in in politics you need to weave a lot of factors together and india somewhere has managed to crack the right balance between socialism between taking care of those who need to be taken care of and providing opportunities for, the, for those who are ready to surge ahead and take the country ahead. So 81 crore people, and in fact a decision was taken by the union cabinet just day before yesterday that the scheme is being extended for the next five years. So when the opposition parties cries that there is poverty, nobody is ready to believe them because, you know, I understand there is a situation where, where you know, people might be slightly less competitive because of the free availability of ration. But at the same time, their basic needs are completely taken care of. They are being provided a foundation where they should ideally and ideally only focus on the larger goals and contribute to it. From 75 odd airports 10 years ago today, India has 150 airports. I don't know how, is there anybody who's from, you know, one of the places where airports has just come up because there are new airports across the country. So today, uh, a Darbhanga, I don't know whether Bangalore is connected to Darbhanga, but you know, a Darbhanga to Bangalore direct flight, in the absence of that flight, it would probably take you 36 to 40 hours because you would travel to Patna and then probably, you know, take another train or you would take a train to Patna. So, you know, I mean, that is how the saving of time is contributing to productive efforts by each and everybody, which is enhancing the economy. The same applies to road construction from a one lakh kilometer stretch of national highways in 2014, there is a 65% increase. The railway modernization is another uh, example of it. But the biggest transformation has come in the defense sector. Today, Indian defense exports has gone up 13 times in the last nine years. 
one, three, thirteen times. And you know, and we, in the last five years, five years ago, we have seen someone demonize HAL left, right, and center, accuse it of receiving, you know, kickbacks in the Rafale, all of which was was complete falsehood. The Supreme Court did not believe it. But today, HAL orders, defense orders that HAL has today is probably the highest across the world. And I think if Ramaya Institute could have, uh, could, you know, gain permission to help the students visit HAL and BEL, Hindustan Aeronautics, Aeronautics Limited and Bharat Electronics Limited, two of the companies which are leading India's charge in the defense sector and probably which are going to put India right up in the defense map where the world is going to buy defense products from India. So I think, you know, that is the level of transformation that one is witnessing across sectors. Just one hour ago, I was with, uh, you know, Mansa ma'am and Padmaja ji and there was a beep on my phone. Apparently, there was a scare. Some 13 schools today in Bangalore have been evacuated because of a terror threat. And terrorism is a subject where, you know, it would be, I, it would be intellectually dis dishonest for me to not dwell upon it. You must be 20, 21, 22. But if you have, but if you were aware of the period between 2005 to 2008, you must have been small kids then, you would not be aware. There used to be a bomb blast invariably every 30 to 40 days on an average. Bangalore has witnessed those bomb blasts, Ahmedabad has witnessed it, Gohati. So, you know, I think as a rota by rotation, there would be bomb blasts across the country. And after every bomb blast, we would run to Pakistan, you know, virtually begging for peace. This approach has changed. Today, India deals with terror, you know, with terrorism with a very firm hand, to an extent where even terror groups, not just in India, but even in Canada, are wary of the Indian establishment. In fact, look at what, what has happened in Canada. Canada, I understand, is a hub of Indian students, a lot of a lot of students go there. But for the last 40 years, it had also become the hub of Khalistan activities, pro-Khalistan activities. In fact, uh, you know, it is on record that way back in 1983, the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi had requested for the extradition of the terrorist who was eventually involved in the Kanishka bombing in 1985. What we have done in the last few weeks is put Canada on notice. The pro-terror activities cannot go on without, you know, it being noticed or without it, without Canada being held accountable to the expansionist designs of China and to the terror attacks of Pakistan was because somewhere we had given up on our defense establishment. That big change is very evident now. And at the same time, today one of our biggest trade partners is Saudi Arabia. One of our biggest strategic partners is Saudi Arabia. So look at how Pakistan stands isolation right across, even in the Islamic world. When Article 370 was abrogated, not even the Islamic world st stood behind, stood behind uh, Pakistan. So these are some very complex issues where India has taken a lead. The challenge for you as students is that for the next 20 years, you are probably going to witness India's most booming phase you are probably going to be a direct witness to India's surge, unprecedented surge. We are galloping ahead on the economic front. You know, today when we have uh, attained a 7.6% GDP growth rate last quarter, there is a video of Raghuram Rajan doing the rounds of, two, of, of two, December 2021, when he had asserted that we would be lucky to get a 5% GDP growth over the next few years. So I think, you know, hard work, conviction and determination changes a lot of things, which Prime Minister Modi has managed to achieve. And I think there is a lot for you guys to learn. For your generation, unlearning is going to be more important than learning. The advent of social media, the advent of digital media provides a level playing field to students of Ramaya vis-a-vis -vis somebody who may not have studied in Ramaya, who may have just, you know, 
been a simple graduate from somewhere, but who has been diligently following up on research, has been drawing up strategies in his mind, marketing strategies, other entrepreneurial strategies. So for this generation, unlearning is more important than learning. And I think, you know, that is where the Institute can probably uh, take a lead by introducing a maybe weekly uh, lecture on unlearning going ahead. Because in our days, you know, we were very focused on what we would learn over here. The unlearning was not so important for this generation. Like I said, there has been a complete democratization of across the world. And when I talk about democratization, that democratization has been achieved by the digital invasion which we have seen in the last few years. So somebody sitting in a remote part of Karnataka might be as aware of you, as, as be as aware of the economic situation in the country, if he you know, has his heart and mind in the right place, if he does up the right kind of reading, and if he has the assimilation abilities. Last week I was in Delhi, and uh, there was an Uber driver who kind of vaguely recognized me. In fact, I posted that video on, uh, on uh, social media. So because I was traveling to the party office, he somehow gathered or he somehow felt I was connected with BJP, even though he did not exactly recognize me. So I asked him, generally got chatting, he was politically aware, I generally got chatting and asked him about his thoughts on certain issues. So, you know, there is this thing there, if you have, I don't know how many of you follow politics closely. Do you, do some of you follow politics closely or very few of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. So I asked him, there is this gentleman who has been repeatedly saying in all his rallies that when you put 1 liter petrol in your car, then 50% of the Adani goes to the तो मुझे ये समझ में नहीं आया आप समझा सकते हो क्या? And you should see his video. वो कहता है बकवास कर रहा है। इसमें कुछ टैक्सेस स्टेट को जाते हैं, कुछ सेंटर को जाते हैं। इसमें दूर-दूर तक अदानी का कोई ये नहीं है। तो मैंने कहा कास्ट। Are you all comfortable with Hindi? तो मैंने I asked him about his you know caste. He said caste से क्या मतलब है? मैं जो भी हूँ in fact, I was at a conference recently and I, there were many speakers and I asked the organizer that before calling me, did you find out about my caste? Did you kind of do a proper check that jitni abadi otne log to jitne, jitne speakers aaye hai, they should be adequately represented from all communities. So they, was, they started laughing. So this is a choice that you need to make. Are you going to buy in to the logic of those people who want to take India three decades back. Caste census hona chahiye, caste ko apna milna chahiye. See, nobody is against caste census. But you should also realize that from 1934 onwards, there has been no upgradation on the, on the classification of castes. As such, if today a caste census takes place, it will be a blatant attempt at fudging data for your personal benefits, which is what has happened in Karnataka and in Chhattisgarh. The two governments did caste census, but they realized that it was so fallacious that they were embarrassed to bring it out. And yet, the leader of that party insists that caste census hona chahiye jitni abadi utne log. So obviously it is for you to decide, you know, which, which community is for 80%, which never got its right. So anyway, you know, the point is today when India is surging ahead with her larger development goals in a very focused manner, focusing on infrastructure creation, focusing on development of human capital, are you in a mood to play ball to caste politics? Because, you know, again, most of you, I, I don't think anybody, any of you must have been born over here, but I'm sure the professors over here are aware of the dark days of early 1990s. The way all of a sudden Mandal Commission Im, Im, uh, recommendations were implemented. I'm not against those recommendations, but the hasty manner in which it was implemented by VP Singh 
without consultations had suddenly resulted in a massive protest across the country. There were people who were self-immolating themselves, students, and there was a massive caste war across the country. I'm sure we don't want to go back to those days when India was on the verge of bankruptcy, when, but that is precisely what certain political groups in this country want, where, want to take us to. So the choices before you are very clear. I think instead of me uh, you know, going on about it, it would be nice to make it more interactive over here. And uh, you know, like uh, I mentioned, apart from the larger involvement with the country's development goals, there are a lot of challenges which you would be individually facing. Because, like I said, uh, the, inv the, digital uh, the digital invasion in your lives comes with, it, with its own set of perils. The family system is declining. The emotional support is declining. And I'm sure a lot of you would be facing pressure, pres performance pressure. So I am open to, you know, it's a good opportunity for us to discuss anything that you wish to discuss. I think let's take it ahead and if you know you have questions let's make it interactive that would be a better way to take it ahead I think it would be nice if some of you come up with queries questions you can criticize the government, I'm perfectly fine with it, because without criticism, one doesn't... Uh, I think the beauty of democracy is that there should be healthy criticism, but not false news spreading and fake news spreading. Uh, and they are a little bit against us, They are well aware of that and it is unaware. And my question is, uh, we are all uh, future leaders in organizations where we have to work with multiple cultural peoples. So, uh, what we have to learn the leadership approach towards this uh, Hinduism and Muslim, Muslim and Hindu centric to, uh, of BJP approach. And what we have to learn the uh, leadership of uh, things we future so as as informed students first of all you should you know first you should uh, contradict anybody first you should rebut anybody who says bjp is anti muslim you know if you look at government schemes every party every party across the world has a certain brand positioning let me explain to you in terms of brand positioning there is a right wing across the world, there is a left wing across the world, right? So even in the US, the Republican is more conservative. Conservative is the right word, better than right wing. So in India, BJP is the conservative party, which unequivocally stands for protection of the rights of the majority. But does that mean that the minority has been, you know, distinguished against it anywhere? You should ideally check out the data of the social welfare schemes of the government when it comes to pr pradhan you know and most of these schemes all, all the schemes are for poor people so when it comes to schemes like pradhan mantri avas yojana you will be surprised that the total number of muslims receiving uh, funds under pradhan mantri avas yojana are as high as 30 percent what is the population of muslims in the country 15 percent Oh, sorry? No, no, it is not 18%. So I, unless you are going by some unofficial data which we are aware of, but, uh, but we, if you go by official data, it is less than 15%. But yes, I mean, if you go by unofficial information, it could be may, way beyond that. But the point is, as, as high as 30% of the total recipients have been from the Muslim community, the same applies to most of the government schemes. So if you look at it, if, if, uh, if Muslims look at it objectively, rather than glorifying Tipu Sultan, which is all that the Congress party has done, 
the actual benefits in their hands have come during this government. But obviously, rhetoric plays a bigger part than actual benefits. And which is why, you know, the, the perception holds that BJP is not pro-Muslims, but that doesn't hold at all. If, if you look at, you know, obviously the other thing which, which people would come up with is the lynching incidents. Again, you go to the NCRB, National Crime Data, Crime Record Bureau data, you will find that twice that many people from the other community have been lynched, but it doesn't suit certain media houses to talk about it. In Brahma, in, in UP, you know, the, the an animosity against Brahmins is so high in the last few months that a couple of Brahmins have been lynched. So who do they cry to? I think the country needs to grow out of this victimhood mindset. And the sooner it gets out of it, the better. Why would a country like Saudi Arabia want such brilliant ties with India? Why would most Islamic nations today want such friendly ties with India if India were actually anti-Muslim? But yes, I mean, like, politics is, a, is an art. You have to carry out a certain brand positioning. And BJP is very proud to stand up for Hindu rights. And BJP is very proud to stand up for the rights of the majority community. Why should we be apologetic about it? Yes, sir. So healthy criticism is something. So healthy criticism is exactly what you've done, and I'm equally, you know, I'm equally fine with it. See, the the larger point is that in the last pre-2014, there was an unnecessary hyphenation across the world when India would would be hyphenated with Pakistan. Why should a country way more progressive, way more prosperous, way more be fine with it? What was the compulsion for us to be, you know, bracketed with Pakistan? Forget terrorism for a point of view. I think any self-respecting country which is way ahead of Pakistan in its, when it comes to the information technology, when it comes to our economic abilities, just because there was this secular, so-called secular mindset that India and Pakistan should be hyphenated, we are brothers born out of the same mother, we kept, you know, pulling ourselves down. That mentality has changed. Today our competition is US, today our competition are way bigger countries and Pakistan has become insignificant. When it comes to Kashmiri Muslims, see conditions, Kashmiri Pandits, when it comes to Kashmiri Pandits, See, the abrogation of Article 370 was some, something nobody had anticipated. That was a very brave move. Now, while we are committed to settling Kashmiri Hindus back in the valley, I know quite a few of them. You know, people move on with, with time. Like a lot of you who have made Bangalore your home in the last three decades may not want to go back to UP or Punjab for whatever reason. And I think this sentiment is equally predominant among Kashmiri Hindus also, Kashmiri Pandits also. It's a matter of time before the, the incidence of terror, terror attacks have come down drastically. It is as low as 20% of what it used to be five years ago. And over a period of time, it will vanish. The onus then would equally be upon the Kashmiri Pandit community also on whether they are prepared to go. Because like I said, I mean, if we can 
reduce Pakistan to where it is. This is a government which works with a lot of resolve and we are committed to get Kashmiri Pandits back in the valley. But like I said, time changes and maybe they themselves may not feel comfortable. So I think, you know, it's a complex issue, but uh, our commitment to Kashmir again uh, stands out with what we have done. So I have a uh, follow-up conclusion for the students, what they asked. The one thing I have to say to that person who asked, like, uh, uh, my brother has told about the Muslim and all these things. I just want to hear the misconceptions. It might be some misconceptions uh, created by some other uh, external factors and the other external. It might be opposition party. So I want them to uh, look at the facts and decide what uh, what has happened back in before 2013 and what is happening now. Look upon the data. We know we are MBA student. You are all you all are educated ones. I want them to analyze and take a decision based on those things. That's the one thing uh, they have to look up at. And the next thing I want to talk over for this person who was uh, told about the Kashmiri Pandits. <laughs> Kashmiri Pandits. So it was like a situation before like uh, removed three seventy. Uh, there was a situation like no one was open to free trade uh, and uh, doing business and all these things were like and uh, have some set of borders over there for the Kashmiri people. It's not only for Kashmiri Pandits, but after removal of three seventy it's like a free trade to the person. It, not, it might be the Kashmir Pandit, it might be some other uh, people from other community. It's a free trade. So they can do business, they can do anything that might be possible. So it's like a same other states like, it has become the same states like other states like from Canada also. So absolutely, like I said, you know, thank, thank you for, thank you for being very, you know, it's not, it's it's not very fashionable to take a strong nationalist position in campuses, so I think, you know, he must be, he must be congratulated. Uh, so I want everyone to get the data, analyze it, ask for the persons who are facing it. So it might, they may See, somewhere, let me, let me take this discussion a little beyond this. You know, somewhere, Gandhi's non-violence was misinterpreted for many governments, subsequent governments over many decades. Non-violence does not mean compromising on your self-respect. Non-violence does not mean pandering to a terrorist nation. But that is precisely what we had been reduced to doing, mainly between 2004 to 2014. And like you mentioned, why should Hurriyat, which was a direct broker of Pakistan, which was a direct agent of Pakistan, why should the Hurriyat have been given the center stage which it got event, which it got between 2004 to 2014? So you know the pictures of Yasin Malik coming in Delhi and being garlanded or being felicitated in, in the Lutyens zone. I think today when you think of it, it embarrasses us. And that is the big difference which, which uh, this country has seen. The same applies to, you know, cases which had been pending for the last many centuries, which we had given up hope on. See, in our growing up years, we had, we had kind of given up hope on many things. We had assumed that there would be no solution to the menace called Pakistan. We had assumed that there would be no dispute to age-old legal disputes like the Ramjan Bhumi Mandir. I think that is what has changed in the last nine years. We have a problem-solving approach. When you solve a problem, it takes away political issues for the future. But then we are not bothered. We'll come up with fresh issues. As long as the country is growing, and that is where, like I said, you know, the, the number of discussions that young students are having today on the economy, on the need for India to, to have a space station, on, on, on targets, basically, that, you know, 2027 is when we'll be the third largest economy, um, when uh, I think uh, the exact figures of GDP, I think this is a very reassuring sign for the entire country. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, sir. So, my question, I have, I basically have three questions here. Uh, the first question is related to the current event, what's happening. As a variety of business in India, for Canada on notice uh, regarding the killing of the person operating in Canada. So, two days back, the US government has charged one Indian national 
It has for our one of Indian national scholarship, claiming that India is attempted to be a Palestinian operator over there. My question is that can India put US on notice as it did to Canada? That is one of my, one of, one of my questions. The second question is related to Chinese immigration in Galwar. So I agree with that that Prime Minister Modi has made a statement to the parliament about the Ministry of Law, but he has never taken a word China. As he repeatedly uses the word Pakistan or any other country, why does he directly target China that you guys are going to here? So let me come to the US first. In the past or even till now, the US has basically been used to all its strategic partners blindly following its instructions. For the first time, that is not happening. It knows that India is a very independent mind. It knows that India will not compromise on, on its sovereignty. So now it's about who blinks first. You know, not just uh, Pannu or Panun. There are many terrorists who have lost their lives in the last, you know, two months. And, and probably it, it will remain a mystery of who did it. But then, at the end of the day, we will be consistent with our stand. If the US thinks that India is involved with an attempt to assassinate Panun, the onus is on the US to furnish adequate information for us to act on it. My question is the reaction of India. When Canada did the same thing, the reaction was aggressive reaction. No, no, sir, that depends. But can it do the same thing with respect to the U.S.? No, no, the question over here is that uh, India being a very sagacious, India, it, the present leadership being a very sagacious leadership, India weighs in the importance of U.S. When it comes to Canada, Canada has been, uh, Canada under Justin Trudeau has been a repeat offender. But U.S. today is India's most important strategic partner and the reciprocation has also been equal because U.S. realizes that, you know, to, to neutralize China in South Asia, India is the U.S.'s best bet. But like I mentioned, U.S. until now has been used to all its strategic partners following its instructions blindly. It won't happen any longer. So I think the mutual respect that you should give to a partner, whether it's a personal equation or a political equation, U.S. will have to give us that. And in this particular case, let U.S. come up with adequate substance or adequate proof to substantiate its claims, then India will respond, which is what our stand has been as of now. And when it comes to mentioning China, see, I think apart from some dumb politicians on the other side, the moment you mention expansionist forces, it is very clear that you are talking about China. So why doesn't, why doesn't the Pakistan, why doesn't it say the same thing about the China? No, no, is it necessary? That's the point. Because it, with China, we still have a certain trade, you know, uh, trade which is going on. They have invaded India Which they have been doing from 1947. We have, for the first time, the Chinese troops are on the Indian land in Ladakh. No, no, they are not. They are not. They are not. They have been driven back. In fact, you know, you should forget any politician. You should trust the army leadership on that. You know, you should trust the army leadership on that because a lot of things over here, a lot of things, a lot of actual execution powers are left entirely to the army leadership. And if the army corroborates that, that uh, the claimed intrusion has not happened. I think you should trust the army on that. Instead, we have we have reclaimed territory which they have tried to intrude, which is No no Doklam in Doklam they, they intruded and they were sent back. The same happened in Arunachal also. What does that mean? What does that mean that is going on? But the Prime Minister is not telling China has to go back. No, no, China, like I mentioned, you know there are a lot more complexities involved in international politics. Our Make in India program is progressing tremendously well. Our Make in India program is progressing tremendously well. And very soon, the impact will be very evident on China. When we won't need imports from China, the imports will come down substantially. So a lot of things, you know, to, uh, if you look at the situation, what has happened with Qatar? Qatar is also playing a blackmailing game. Do we need to mention Qatar at every instance or do we also, you know, employ back-channel negotiations? International diplomacy... I totally agree with you. 
No, no, I'm just saying international diplomacy has many different components. Apart from rhetoric, rhetoric is only the outermost component. International diplomacy has at least five more components attached to it, and officials on the ground are adequately taking care of the situation. That's all I can uh, my tell you. My question is that you, we all appreciate the damn policy of the government of India. Then, then, after mm -hmm. a mobile phone law, we appreciate it. It's going very great. But why don't you give a credit to the previous government which brought Ada? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because. What, what no, no, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why since you, you know, seem, seem to be missing the old government a lot. See, Aadhaar at that point of time, Aadhaar at, Aadhaar, Aadhaar pre-2014 pre was conceived very differently. It was merely supposed to be, it was largely supposed to be as an instrument of uh, identity for you as a citizen. There was some Social welfare, no, no, you check the data on this. There was some, there was some social welfare schemes attached to it, but today the entire purpose of Aadhaar is completely different. 300 plus schemes are being executed through a 30 lakh crore worth of amount. So I think, you know, the purpose of Aadhaar then and the purpose of Aadhaar now is completely different. And in politics, if you're so gracious, you know, you might end up losing more of it. We are in the habit of winning. You may have a problem with our, you know, with our certain behavior, but at the end of the day, you know, we've been good boys for too long. We don't believe in being very good boys. We believe in winning and we'll continue to win. Asking banks mm -hmm. to increase their capital from 35% of their exposure to consumer loans to 125%, which essentially means if you and I run a bank mm -hmm. and we have a 1,000 crore exposure to consumer loans, we are till yesterday happy with 35%, 350 crores as mm -hmm. capital. And RBI comes out and says, no, no, consumer loans are on the verge of default. We can't allow you to operate with just 350 crores. Increase that to 1,250 crores. Mm -hmm. So you would appreciate that for a bank to raise 900 crore capital on that with the current interest rates across the world is not going to be easy. So what all the banks are most likely to do is to get rid of their consumer loan exposure to newly born companies mm -hmm. operating out of Bandra Kurla complex. You know, gifting away consumer loans of all the nationalized banks to this new player, benefiting the shareholders of that company. My second question is, the GST notices that have been raining on businesses non-stop, is that the ease of doing business where businessmen have to respond to GST notices? And repeatedly Mohandas Pai and others have spoken about the tax terrorism and it seems to have fallen on deaf ears. Can you address these two issues? You know, I'll, I'll need to check on the first thing that you mentioned because a lot of these no notifications come out and I have been more involved with the political part in the last few days. I will check on it and probably I can respond to you because uh, the intent behind this announcement, I'm not aware of it. Because many of these circulations keep kept happening from the ministries and the ministries are more in sync with the, the logic behind it at that point of time. Uh, the second part, what, what was that? Uh, the GST notices that have literally been grown. On, no, on the contrary, I think over the years they have gone down because 2017-18 the government was completely abreast of you know the high notices being churned out. In the last couple of years or in the last one year specifically, the reports that we have received is that those those you know the resolution of these disputes have become much easier. In fact, uh, when it comes to personal income tax, people have been, there are people who've got the refunds in record period of 35 days. So anyway, that is a work in progress because GST was a landmark mark reform and it was not easy to execute it. There were teething problems for the first two, three years and they have been the complaints and the issues have been progressively coming down. 
I think over, over the next one or two years, I, I can assure you that they will be further streamlined and brought down the complaints and the, the glitches that is going ahead. That is a commitment which I can give you. No, no, I think the, the, the defeats along the way only teach us because we continue to learn. You said you are kidding, right? so I no, no, I said we stop being the good boys. I, I know some of you might not like us, you know, not being gracious about certain things. You, the point is BJP is a party of 18 crore people. I can't take the onus on behalf of everybody. Personally, if you ask me, I try to be gracious or I will give the credit to the previous governments where possible. But these questions don't make sense. If we are not gracious, maybe, you know, we are, we are being uh, the, you know, uh, we, we just, we've stopped being the good boys that we were. You'll have to go back to the Vajpayee era for that. To, to... <laughs> Yeah, hello, sir. sir, from the beginning of the point, you are like, always explaining the modernization towards digital platform uh, and uh, many other things that GDP uh, don't expect. Coming back to the point like, which I want to uh, ask you, like uh, the violence which happened in uh, Manipur, sir. We are talking about Pakistan and being such a, like, uh, with other countries, we are talking about such, such a big thing that we can handle the Pakistan things. We are not only really able to handle our own nations, this uh, northeast uh, violence. How can we literally uh, handle those part of expect? Well, what happened in Manipur was extremely, uh, was what happened no, in... No, 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 sorry, Mr. You, you have been, uh, you have said that like, uh, certain things you have given uh, about the caps that has been distributed towards uh, rural, rural area. And uh, you have said that uh, the women uh, near to that rural area will be able to save three hours and they can invest those three hours into this education. Do you really think that uh, the rural, uh, rural area have got those facilities to utilize those times? You need to travel there to see for yourself. I have almost traveled 22 states in India and being in the Nordic part, I have always because the change is very visible in the villages if you go. Anyway, see, what happened in Manipur was extremely shameful for the nation. Nobody can deny that. You know, and uh, unfortunately, like uh, my friend over here mentioned, you know, when you discuss the problems of the present without, you know, feeling the need to escape responsibility, one also needs to be cognizant, one also needs to be aware of the history of the dispute. So the cookie Methi dispute is something which has existed from 1947. Between 2017 March till April 2023 was in fact one of the most peaceful phases where there was no violence, where the drug mafia was, was dealt a heavy blow, one of the reasons for the, the violence eventually because there are too many factors involved beyond what you see and narco terrorism has been at the core of the violence in Manipur. Having said that, things are under control right now. There was a hand of China which we are aware of, which we will be acting on. Unfortunately, like I said, I mean, uh, these, these, this violence had a legacy to it. It could have been handled better. It could have been prevented. But uh, in a country as vast as India, sometimes, despite all your efforts, you know, things don't fall under control too quickly because of the multiple, multiple ethnic ethnicities and the multiple ethnic disputes which have been, which have existed for many, many decades. We have proven uh, to other countries that we are in such a position that uh, we are continuously in a development form. Uh, like, basically, has been always proving these things towards like uh, other countries. If we are able to do such things with other countries, then why can't we do with like uh, a small, a small so, state like India? We can do no, no, so does, does US not have gunfire 
episodes where, you know, all of a sudden 10 people get killed. This, the fact is that, you know, nobody is defending what happened in Manipur. But developed Bharat or Vixit Bharat, unfortunately, in no part of the world can you give an assurance that there will be zero dispute or there will be, because human, human beings across history have had a history of disputes. China kills Uyghur Muslims left, right and center and 55 Muslim nations don't talk about it. China apparently is also a developed nation. We will be a better developed nation where, you know, unsavory episodes like the one you saw in Manipur will hopefully not be repeated or will be minimized while being true to the constitution as much as possible. So I want to know there are lots of students who literally don't have any idea regarding that there are uh, money to exist, whether uh, the money to exist in India itself. So being related, are there students who have their students? Yeah, I know. Look, does anybody believe Manipur does not exist in India? No. <laughs> yeah, because there are, no, there, are, there are certain parties which remove POK from Indian map, they remove Manipur from Indian map. Don't fall for that. <laughs> So, you know, like I mentioned again, if you look at the work that has happened today, Northeast is 10 times better connected to Delhi, Bangalore and, and other parts of the country than it was 10 years ago. When you connect those cities better, that is when people from that part of the country come to this part of the country to settle down and vice versa. So, connectivity infrastructure is at the core of the development. In fact, yeah, that's what BJP government provides such facilities to many so that they can... So, I, I think over here you need to, you, even if you just do a Google search on infrastructure development northeast, you will come across every possible information of the vast transformation that the northeast has seen in the last nine years. Whether it is about six new airports, whether it is rail connectivity all the way to Nagaland and to Manipur, whether it is, you know, uh, on, the, on the train front. So I think, you know, in fact, Northeast is something we take a lot of pride in. If you remove Manipur, if you remove what happened in Manipur, the development in the Northeast has been one of the key assets of our government. Whether it is Assam where, where you know, we had given up on the Bangladeshi immigrants, whether it is Meghale or any other part of the country, whether it is the drug trade in Manipur, and mind you, you know, we don't, the media in Delhi doesn't talk much about it. But one of the reasons for the violence which escalated was the way the government had gone after the drug trade happening in the hills supported by Myanmar and, uh, you know, other external forces. So, in fact, Northeast is the, is one of the key achievements of the government, barring, of course, you know, what has happened in Manipur in the last four or five months. This one of the ways could be if you decide to find employment in Northeast, you know, consciously, that could be one way to spread awareness about the Northeast. Maybe Ramaya Institute might want to open a campus in the Northeast somewhere. That could be the other ways where, you know, some integration could be worked out. Uh, yeah, I appreciate your patience in, uh, in responding to the set questions. Uh, just to add to it, uh, yeah, Manipur issue center did not uh, really respond in the way out to be because that has not, I mean, Manipur is actually the North northeastern part of the region. People from there are not feeling that they are treated equally around the other state. That sentiment we have to, again, I mean, that has to be addressed by the center, one thing. Uh, but uh, when you are mentioning about the 100% uh, uh, Swachhwal Kabiyan getting, you know, uh, achieving 100% uh, results in uh, sanitation which is not yet happened and the government owned record speed and it is on, it's on record payable. So that has to be addressed. If at all the BJP government is taking this 
physical positivity, I expect this to be taken seriously. And the third thing is socialism and the capitalism hand in going hand in hand and achieving uh, the desired result. When you're thinking about that, I just have one question. The recent Oxfam reports very clearly mentioning growing disparity among hacks and unknowns and it's so huge that uh, especially after pandemic, it is so huge that unknowns are just left from their own. That's what we're feeling across. And especially job creation, 40 years high unemployment. You here are very really worried about it. So I expect uh, the central government to seriously take some action on it and I would like to know what's your uh, response to that. See, um, you know, it depends on it depends on which data you're referring to because a Niti Aayog paper recently, if you refer to a Niti Aayog paper, 13.5 crore people have been brought out of multidimensional poverty in the last four years. When it comes to unemployment, unemployment has been a big problem all the time. But today you also need to understand that the nature of jobs is changing. You know, one of the reasons why the data doesn't capture the exact situation is because gig economy, gig economy and the contractual nature of jobs is far more than what it used to be eight or nine years ago. But again, if you look at data, this, whether it is CMI report, the latest CMI report, or whether it is the, the EPS uh, data, at this particular point of time, unemployment is at its four year low. That does not mean the problem does not exist. You know, people are moving to... I want your thoughts, leadership thoughts on, on this aspect. The AI, AI is taking away a lot of jobs. And in a country like India, where we want, we are, we want, there are millions of unemployed youth. What are your thoughts on leadership, leadership jobs and AI taking away a lot of jobs? Well, you know, the challenge of the, the, the challenge of AI is an evolving challenge and I think one would, one would wait for a couple of more years to have a very, have a more accurate idea of the situation. But having said that, you know, like the same, same apprehensions were expressed way back in 1985 when computers were coming in. The same apprehensions were expressed when mobile phones were coming in. So I don't think the loss of job will be so significant. The nature of jobs are evolving, the nature of jobs are changing, and I think that is where the unlearning becomes more important. So I think after all that you learn, a conscious effort, a meditative effort at unlearning and finding out what best suits you and what gels with the country's requirement is what will be the way ahead. Uh, like uh, in America, they have some schemes like uh, free, uh, free for uh, free electricity and other things. It's actually increasing our debt. So uh, for India to grow, uh, debt should be decreased. So uh, how can BJP help that so that the debt can be decreased in India? So in the last few years, in fact, there was a Times of India edit page article by Arvind Subramaniam just two days ago. If any of you have read that. India's tax collection is at its highest. The tax compliance is at its highest. One of the reasons why we have been able to bear the brunt or one of the reasons why we have been able to successfully bear the pressure of freebies. Having said that, I completely agree with you. Going ahead, you know, a concerted attempt by all parties. Unfortunately, you know, the meeting of minds between, between two parties is not there right now because of the vast disparity in thought process and focus areas. But ideally, all parties should get together and take a conscious decision on how freebies can be reduced if not completely done away with. Because the five guarantees, because the five guarantees ultimately can lead to only one guarantee which is of decline and going back. <laughs> So, sir, in the beginning you say that uh, the population bill should not have been, I mean, it's people are saying that it should be enacted, but it should have been enacted in the 1970s. So, I totally agree, but I am giving a stat, uh, realized that in Kerala, uh, 
the majority of the population, 3-4% of the population is in the group. 25-26% is Muslim. But if you see the daily birth rate, Hindu is 41%, Muslim is 41%. I am not having any propaganda or anything. I am just saying that if you are saying that you should have been enacted in the 1970s, if we enact it right now also, there should there have been some limitation, right? So what are your views on this? You know, it can be enacted on a state-to-state -state basis. Assam had a bill, uh, Assam had a similar bill a few years ago. I, uh, could you just repeat the, the data that you mentioned about, uh, you mentioned? No, no, the, the rate of growth of Hindu and Muslim. So the population being, Hindu is being double than what of Muslims, that rate of growth of Muslims is more than of Hindus. This data is as of so I guess uh, you, in the beginning you say that No, no, so you know the point is it's a sensitive topic. If you bring, if you bring the bill, if you bring the bill and one community follows the law, the other does not, is the state equipped to hand over punishment or is the, is the, is the state equipped to penalize it? That's what makes it a very tricky issue. In 2019, I guess the bill was passed by Rakesh Singh. That was a private member bill. Private member bills are... Private, every parliamentarian has a right to bring up a pal, private member bill, but private member bill sel, seldom gets uh, accepted by the government per se. So, so even now there is a, there is a private member bill which is pending on the population control. But you know it, there are too many complexities involved right now because as it is in certain sections of society the declining trend is very visible, and among the youth also, you know I'm sure most. Many of you would be sanskari youth who might want to get married and have children, but there are people now who want to get married in their late 30s and opt for a dog instead of a child. So as it is, the population, over a period of time, over the next two decades, the population is bound to start declining the way it, it, it happened in China. So many things, many... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. You said we can't be dedicated to the nature, we also have to take certain steps. See, you know, there are there are things you know when it when you when it comes to smoking, when it comes to smoking. For the longest time, India has had a direct advertisement, smoking causes cancer. Yeah. But I don't know how much has it led to people giving up on smoking or reducing smoking. When it comes to road accidents and safe driving, for the longest time we've had the message safe driving. But again, you know, some, somewhere you can neither legally penalize smokers nor can you legalize, uh, legally penalize rash drivers. So the population issue, the population conundrum is something similar. You can talk it out with people, you can try to drill sense, but at the end of the day, it leads to a lot of complexities and not that the government has not toyed with the idea, it's just that there are more problems than solutions inherent in that. I think we can close. <laughs> but it has to end, it has to end with a very... Positive question. No, no, so No, I'll, I'll, I, I, so I will, so you know, when we, we when we formed the P government with PDP, what was the what was the election results? 28 seats for PDP, 25 seats for BJP in an 83 member assembly. The way things existed, even if there were immediate elections, you know, there would have been possibly another hung assembly. I think unlike other parties which cling to power, like we saw in Maharashtra, we utilized that time to understand what, you know, all the shady activities that was going on in Kashmir. When we realized that PDP could never get out of its jive jive mentality, unlike the Agadi government in Maharashtra, which went on a extortion spree, we quit that government and within one year of that, 
we brought the article, you know, abrogated Article 370. And today, PDP is as much an enemy for us as Pakistan is. Shall we close the question answer session, boys and girls? We have two more questions. But yeah, I think we'll just close it. We have a few more academic tasks back at the institute. So, Dwin, you can wind up quickly. Ma'am has certain interviews to take. But it's so interesting for them to uh, see you ask. We'll have to make it fast. We'll have to make it fast. Uh, regarding this notification of the development, I want to uh, fix up regarding on that. So, uh, Modi government has said that they are going to give 7 lakh crores for the infrastructure development of the markets of India. And they have reached 12,000 liter rate, 2.2 crores for the reform of the I can go to visit Manipur. Wait, wait. I think infrastructure development is the one thing which. Wait, wait. Infrastructure development is the one thing which develops all the sectors of the human cycle. And that's the one which is given by the Modi government is helping South East too. As sir said, the number of journals are building up. Number of are building up. That will lead to the development of the North East. It will lead to the development of the And I want to. I want to address students uh, over here. Consider it's, it's your life. If you are opting for short term work, you will be destroying your long term work. It's like the same thing which is going with the Indian government. Yeah. Vijay government is looking for short term work of the nation, but the Congress government is looking for short term guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I think uh, you know the other sides needs young leaders, and I think you should you should join the other side quickly because they uh, because <laughs> that because that would that would make that would make our democracy livelier. Right now, there's no contest, sure. so we need important people on the other side. Thank you, thank you. What a wonderful interaction this has been. Uh, to him, I would request you to kindly come forward. I request Dr. Manasa. Uh, Niranjan sir to kindly come forward. We would like to felicitate and sincerely thank Tuhin for taking out his time and spending his precious time with us and our students. Thank you so much Tuhin. We'd like to felicitate you with a memento and a shawl. like to felicitate you with a Mysore peta which is given as a as, as a token of regard so that's the cap Thank you. 